What are your plans toward American citizens who are in Ukraine and might be there during an invasion? Uh, what scenarios would you put American troops to rescue and get Americans out? They're not. That's a world war. When Americans and Russians start shooting at one another, we're in a very different world than we've ever been in. What I've asked is American citizens should leave, should leave now. We're dealing with one of the largest armies in the world. This is a very different situation, and things could go crazy quickly. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Johnson in Los Angeles, sitting in for Nicole Wallace. That was President Biden during his one-on-one -on -one interview yesterday with NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt, sending a dire warning for Americans still in Ukraine to get out before the situation gets worse. The president's warning comes amid a flurry of actions today. Ukraine's military warning that the country is basically surrounded by Russian forces as they continue to conduct military exercises. Exercise Ukraine says are preparations for live fire operations. U.S. officials estimate that Russia has amassed at least 130,000 troops at Ukraine's borders, enough for a full-scale invasion. In response, a senior defense official tells NBC News that the United States will be sending 3,000 additional troops from the 82nd Airborne to Poland in the coming days. Meanwhile, on the diplomatic front, the White House confirms that President Biden will be speaking with Vladimir Putin by phone tomorrow morning. Today, the president held a call with NATO allies to further coordinate what the White House calls, quote, diplomacy and deterrence. While U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken sounded the alarm this morning in Australia that Russians' invasion could come at any time even before the end of the Winter Olympics in Beijing. A timeline that was echoed during the White House press briefing late this afternoon by National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, who also reiterated... Oh, sorry. We continue to, to see signs of Russian escalation, including new forces arriving at the Ukrainian border. As we've said before, we are in the window when an invasion could begin at any time, should Vladimir Putin decide to order it. Whatever happens next, the West is more united than it's been in years. NATO has been strengthened. The alliance is more cohesive, more purposeful, more dynamic than at any time in recent memory. We want to be crystal clear on this point. Any American in Ukraine should leave as soon as possible and in any event in the next 24 to 48 hours. We obviously cannot predict the future. We don't know exactly what is going to happen. But the risk is now high enough and the threat is now immediate enough that this is what prudence demands. The possibility of an imminent Russian invasion of Ukraine is where we start this hour. Joining us, New York Times diplomatic correspondent Michael Crowley. Also, MSNBC national security analyst Frank Fagluzzi, former assistant director for counterintelligence at the FBI, and former undersecretary of state for public diplomacy, Rick Stengel. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Rick, I'll start with you. I listened to what President Biden said with Lester Holt last night. He basically said, we're not trying to do this. Direct conflict with the Russians is, is World War III. I mean, there was a, literally the terms that he used. He said, everybody get out. This is not going to be Argo. We're not going to run in and save you. So what is the purpose of the United States right now engaging in diplomacy or sending troops to Poland if the president's made it pretty clear that we're not going to get into armed combat over Ukraine if the Russians invade? Well, we were never going to get into armed combat, Jason. I mean, Ukraine is not a NATO country, as uh, as we all know. I mean, I think what happened with between President Biden and that kind of extraordinary press briefing that Jake Sullivan did is they said the die is cast, which is a kind of an appropriate expression because that's what Caesar said when he crossed the Rubicon to invade Rome, that, that all of the preparations seem to be in place for an invasion. I hope they're wrong. You always want to go the extra mile for peace, uh, which is why uh, President Biden is talking to President Putin tomorrow. You want to sacrifice as much as you possibly can to prevent a war from happening. And uh, that's what they're trying to do. But apparently all the intelligence, which they can't tell us about, is pointing towards the fact that an invasion of some kind, and the dimension of that remains to be seen, is inevitable. Michael, we're going to have this call. President Biden is going to have a conversation with Vladimir Putin. What can we imagine is going to be the substance of that call? I mean, 
you know, obviously President Biden isn't going to threaten him. Ukraine isn't a NATO country. Is he going to say, please don't do it? Is he going to say, hey, can you wait till after the Olympics? Like, from a diplomatic standpoint, what levers and what leverage does the United States have with Russia if they are dead set on invading Ukraine? Well, not a lot. I mean, what Biden officials will insist to you, and there's some truth to it, is that the United States still wields enormous economic power and can use sanctions to uh, inflict some harm on Russia's economy. But, you know, particularly with uh, European countries that have more sort of financial skin in the game, uh, nervous about this, there's a limit to how hard we really can hit the Russian economy. Um, and it also brings threats to the global economy. And among other things, um, there's no talk in Washington of trying to cut off, for instance, Russia's oil exports, which really could hurt uh, Putin and Russia overall, but would drive up gas prices in the United States and is not something that President Biden seems willing to consider, uh, especially with midterm elections coming and inflation causing him problems already. So what else can he do? He can reiterate um, you know, those threats. He can talk about how he's going to continue to bolster NATO allies to give Putin something that he says he doesn't want, which is a stronger NATO, more NATO forces along his borders. But the question is, does Biden have anything new? It, you know, given that it looks like this really may be about to happen, is Biden willing to make some kind of a new diplomatic offer that he hasn't yet? For instance, some sort of compromise on Ukraine where he says, OK, we're ready to agree that Ukraine does not join NATO for the X, X number of years to come. But I'm not even sure Putin would accept that. And I doubt Biden's going to try that. Frank, uh, we have some information here from NBC's Courtney Cube reporting on the U.S. analysis of routes for invasion. What it says here is the Russian military could take nine different routes into Ukraine in a full-scale invasion, according to U.S. military and intelligence assessment. The tanks could potentially reach Kiev, the capital, within 48 hours. Russia has already deployed nearly 100, 000, uh, nearly 100 of the military's 168 battle battalion tactical groups, composed of 800 to 900 troops each with more flowing every day. And President Vladimir Putin has dispatched personnel and equipment from six of the seven Russian Special Operations Unit, according to the assessment. I, I, look, if you told me, Frank, that somebody got chips and wings and soda and salsa and napkins and paper plates, I would guess that there is a Super Bowl party that's fairly imminent. Is there any way that we can look at what's happening in Russia right now and say, look, this is practice, they're just trying to scare people, or do we have to assume that an invasion is imminent? Is imminent? Look, there's every appearance that, that something is going to happen in terms of whether it's a limited invasion or a full-scale invasion, but you can only, military experts will tell you, you can only keep troops, this amount of troops and armament in a ready position for so long, particularly with regard to winter elements in, involved. So something's coming. Um, the idea that, that Putin would say, never mind, we were just drilling um, and go away is not to know Putin as an individual and his personality. He cannot do that kind of reasonable thing after he's shown this kind of force to the world. So the question now um, for, for many of us uh, that are in the counterintelligence and intelligence business is, what does this look like moving forward? We're all focused on armament and troops, but let's understand something. The new battlefield is cyber, right? So it's quite likely that in terms of preparing the battlefield, we're going to see attached to any movements a major full-scale cyber attack, shutting out the lights in Ukraine is not outside the realm of possibility. And for our allies, including ourselves, that might come to the aid of Ukraine in some way, shape, or form, don't be surprised to see some kind of denial of service attacks, particularly in our military and defense sector. That kind of thing is going to play out. And then the war of words to shape the minds of Americans is going on every night on networks like Fox News. Every time I, I, I tune in, as long as I can bear it, I hear things like, what's the big deal? Why why should we care about something happening this far away? We should care if we care about democracy. We should care if we care about the rights of a free people to determine their own destiny. We should care about an unchecked authoritarian who poisons his own people and tosses dissidents out of windows. That's why we should care. That's why we should pay attention. But that war for the American mind is going on right now. Uh, speaking of minds, Rick, I have to ask you this. I. I I hate it when we armchair, you know, do armchair psychology of world leaders. But we have to do that right now with Vladimir Putin. 
Why now? What is going on either with Vladimir Putin's particular level of power within Russia or his perceived standing in the world right now? Why is he deciding to do this right here, right now, a year into the Biden administration, different kind of administrations abroad? Like, what is his internal calculation and psychology? It's not like it's not like he's got to worry about poll numbers the way a democratically elected president does. So what's his motivation right now? You know, Jason, I is wish it, I knew. Is that for me? And, oh. oh, no, it's for Rick. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, Jason, I wish I knew. Um, I spent about six hours with him, interviewing him in 2010. And um, the things that struck me was, first, of course, of how cool and aloof he was and how unwilling he was to, to ingratiate himself in any way, but also how deeply affected he was by grievance, by, by the fact that he believed the West disregarded Russia. Uh, he said in that interview, the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union, if you can imagine that. So he's animated by grievance. Uh, by the way, his campaign slogan, of course, for his whole presidency is make Russia great again. Why he's doing it now, rather than when his ally Donald Trump was in office, I don't know. Perhaps he perceives the West as weak and divided, which is what he's trying to do. I think the rational calculus is hard to make. I mean, Mike McFaul wrote a column recently about how he was with Putin and Biden, and Putin said to Biden, you think because I look like you, I think like you. I don't. We don't know how he thinks. Frank, uh, you have some thoughts on, on what might actually be motivating, either psychologically or politically, uh, why Putin's doing what he's doing now. Well, I think I think Rick is, is spot on. There's a huge ego here and a vision to take to take back what was what he still views as the Soviet Union, and and so. Under, under Trump, he was, uh, he was in the spotlight. I mean, you know, you couldn't say Trump on television without saying Putin in the same sentence. And he, I think he relished that. And, and now no one's paying attention to him in his mind. And this is a form of saying, I'm still a relevant player. I still have things to say and do. I can still impact the United States. You can't do anything about it. And let's not let's not belittle the possibility that the Olympics are tied into this. When he hosted the Olympics in, in Sochi, Russia, the Winter Games there, you know, right, right after what he called the successful games, he he took action and and things happened in Ukraine. And he he's wants to tell the world, I could do this again in this same time. Michael, you know, when we look at the sort of aggressive nature of Russia, it's not just something that the United States is concerned about. We have the story now about uh, French President Emmanuel Macron refused a Kremlin request that he take a Russian COVID-19 test when he arrived to see President Vladimir Putin this week to prevent Russia from getting a hold of Macron's DNA. Now, look. I love Daniel Craig and No Time to Die as much as the next person. But when you've got world leaders literally worried about their DNA being taken, one, what does that say about the level of distrust between Russia and the rest of NATO right now? And two, what on earth did the French think that Russia was going to do with Macron's DNA? Clone him? <laughs> well, it's an incredible thing. You know, I have to say there's no trust of Russia. Obviously, you know, the Russian government, probably Putin himself, has authorized the use of nerve agent to assassinate critics, uh, polonium in, in, a, in a pot of tea. You know, the, I mean, the Russians are very creative about how they'll try to take somebody out. Having said that, I, the first time I can remember having a conversation with a senior U.S. government official about this subject of protecting DNA was maybe six or seven years ago. This has been on the radar um, of top national security people for a long time. I don't completely understand it. I know that part of it, and it may not be the entirety of it, is there's concern, believe it or not, I know it sounds like science fiction, that a foreign government or some sort of super advanced you know, terrorist actor could try to design a, a virus or some, something that would get wow. into the system of a person based on their GNA, and you could exploit, I, I suppose you would find weaknesses or 
defects in the DNA that you could try to exploit. And this has been an issue for many years. And I, I gather, although I've not reported on this directly myself, that you know when the president goes to any kind of foreign um, location, if he takes a drip, drink of water or uses a napkin or whatever, the Secret Service swoops in and scoops all that stuff up afterwards so that he doesn't leave DNA behind. So it's not to say that they trust they trust Putin less than almost anyone else, but this is also actually a, a much broader issue that's really fascinating. You could do a whole show on it. Yeah, I'm glad that Rick got through that interview you mentioned years ago with, with Putin uh, and got back here safely. Thank you so very much. Michael Crowley and Rick Stengel, thank you for joining us today. And starting off this hour, Frank Flugluzzi is sticking around with us for later on in the show.